Good morning, church. Hello, hello. Good morning. Merry Christmas. Let's stand up and proclaim Jesus' name from the rooftops this morning. Amen.
Every heart 
are continuing to mend. We thank you for that great and mighty work. We thank you for the air that we breathe. We thank you for the time that you give us so that we can proclaim your name, Jesus. We are created to worship Jesus, and we are just here to worship you this morning, Lord. You do give us the air in our lungs. You have given us our lives. So, Jesus, we just pour these things back out to you. Just give this straight back to you, Jesus, because it's all yours. It's all for you. Now, Lord, just open our hearts today to hear from you. Stir our hearts with your Holy Spirit. Just give us ears to hear what you're saying today. Change us, Lord. Just change our hearts. Now, church, let's sing this chorus one more time as we finish this prayer. It is, it is his bread. It's your bread. like to tell you a little something about myself. There used to be a time when if I saw Christmas decorations going up too early, I didn't like it. And um, I used to feel that way. I don't feel that way anymore. And there's a reason why it doesn't bother me anymore, because I realize that for a lot of people, this is the time of year when they really have hope, when they really are excited. You know, most of the year is just a drudgery for people, but when they put up Christmas lights and decorations and things like that, it gives them a little bit of hope. There's light in the darkness, just like we sang about. So it doesn't bother me anymore. I used to be very, you know, grinchy and scroogey and humbuggy or whatever you want to call it, but not anymore. Not anymore. Christmas, for some people, is the only time when they seem to have hope. And when Jesus entered into the world, the world was dark, spiritually dark. There was not much hope. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, it's a verse that talks about Jesus before he was born. And Isaiah 9, 2 says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Now you know how risky it is to walk in darkness, right? You ever venture through your house in the darkness and think, oh, I know my way around. I know what's on the floor. Sometimes it can be very dangerous. It's dangerous to walk in the dark. We need a light to guide us through the darkness physically, but certainly spiritually. Isaiah said the people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. As Christmas approaches, this is the time of year to share light and hope with people who are still in the dark. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 is a verse talking about a bright light, a great light that has dawned. And that light is Jesus. Jesus would later say, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. <coughs> I mean, when is the best time to look at Christmas lights? in the dark. On your way to church this morning, they don't look very good, but they shine in the dark. That's what Jesus does. That's who Jesus is. He is the light shining in the darkness. And we need to remember also that Jesus said that we are the light of the world, and he wants us to shine in the darkness. So 
So for those people who celebrate Christmas but still need Christ, for those people who still need Jesus Christ, we can be the light to them. We can share the light of Jesus Christ with them. As we have communion today, we're going to think about how Jesus is the light of the world. And he rescued you and me and many others from darkness. And he's still doing that today. Let's uh, bow and pray together before we have communion. Dear Lord God, we thank you that in a land and world of darkness, Jesus was born into this world. And the light dawned. The light that brings hope and joy and peace and salvation and forgiveness. We thank you that Jesus is the light. Jesus appeared to us and illuminated our lives. And Lord, we thank you that Jesus came into this world to give us light, and he also came to give us a life, not just physical, earthly life, but eternal life. We thank you that Jesus is the light, and we pray that he would continue to dawn in the lives of people around us through your love and as we love other people. We pray in Jesus' name. Let's have the bread and the cup together to remember Jesus is the light. appreciate the generosity that takes place at our church in so many ways. We thank you for the offerings that we receive in our offering box, and we are asking for a special offering over the next week, over the next, by next Sunday. There's an insert in your bulletin that we are collecting sweatshirts, jackets, and hoodies for the uh, children of uh, Malloy Head Start, so your assignment is to do a little shopping this week, pick up a few jackets, hoodies, sweatshirts, whatever you can pick up, that would be great. Encourage other people to pitch in and help you out if you like, maybe neighbors or coworkers or family and friends. But let's uh, do that over this next week uh, as we collect uh, these clothes for the children of Malloy Head Start. And uh, just uh, bring those donations to the church next week so we can distribute them. And again, we thank you that every time our church is called on to give. We give very generously, so we are very thankful for that. And we give because God gives. We give because God is so generous in giving to us. So let's have a prayer for our offering. Dear Lord God, we thank you for your generosity. We thank you that you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. All the blessings we receive come from your hands, Lord. And Lord, we want to be a blessing to the children at Malloy Head Start. So as we collect jackets and hoodies and sweatshirts, please uh, let us be generous and, and faithful during this time. As we have so many times before, Lord, we thank you for the great generosity that occurs here at the church and in the community. Thank you that there are other people in the community working together to help those in need. And Lord, we thank you that you help us every day in every situation. We thank you, we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Now, we are covering what I consider the greatest story ever. That's the story of Jesus. And, uh, you know, we've talked about what it takes to write a good story, to create a good story. If you're going to have a good story, you definitely need characters. Who is this story about? You need to know when it happens. Every story has a conflict. And the conflict usually comes about because there's some kind of opponent or enemy or adversary. That's what makes the conflict, that's what draws you in. If there's no conflict, if there's no enemy, if there's no problem, if there's no struggle, it's not much of a story, right? So you got to have a hero and a villain. And some of these heroes and villains are very familiar to us. Superman's arch enemy was uh, Lex Luthor, uh, Batman and the Joker. I mean, some of these heroes have multiple villains. <coughs> Dorothy had to deal with the Wicked Witch. Harry Potter had to deal with Voldemort. And uh, in Star Wars, you have Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. And you can... You can come up with dozens of these, but this, this is what you find in every story. There's a hero and a villain, and that's what causes the conflict in the story. Now, the hero of the Christmas story is really easy. The hero of the Christmas story is Jesus, because he's the one who was born into this world to save us.
But even, even in this story, there's a villain. And the villain in the Christmas story is King Herod. And we're going to look at King Herod's story this week. We talked a little bit about it in small groups last week. In Matthew chapter 2, where we're headed today, you have the story of King Herod and the Magi. Obviously, the Magi are heroes. But Herod is the villain. He's the villain lurking in the shadows uh, in Matthew chapter 2. He's the villain who is at work in the birth story of Jesus. But we need to figure out what can we learn from Herod? What can we learn from this villain who was opposed to Jesus? Well, let's find out as we get into the story of Herod and the Magi after the birth of Jesus in Matthew chapter 2. We'll start in verse 1, Matthew 2 verse 1. It says, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So in the, in the first few verses here, we see the hero and the villain. The hero is Jesus. And the villain is Herod. The Magi come along and they say, we're looking for the one who has been born king of the Jews. They're looking for Jesus. But Herod thinks he's the king of the Jews. That's how he likes to refer to himself. So the Magi were looking for the king of the Jews, Jesus. Herod's thinking, I'm the king of the Jews that you should be looking for. Now, Herod is called Herod the Great, but he's not really a great guy in any way. He was really great at one thing, and that's that was construction or building. I'd like to show you a picture of a place called Herodium. This is a this was a fortress that Herod built for himself. You can see it's built way up on a hill, way up on a mountain, because you know that if you're in battle, if you're protecting yourself, it's always best to have the high ground, right? And Herod built himself several fortresses, fortresses like this. You can go visit Herodium over in the Holy Land today. It's between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Now, Herod, since he was the king, and since he's building a fortress for himself, you realize he's not, he's not going to spare any expense, right? He's going to go all out in building a fortress for himself. So he built a fortress on this hill large enough to house 1,000 soldiers. He had a, a mini army in there if he needed them. If he needed to escape from an enemy, he was going to take a thousand soldiers with him. In this fortress, he had a one-year food supply, a one-year food supply stashed away. He also had an aqueduct to bring himself fresh water. And just so he wouldn't be, you know, suffering in his fortress, he even had a steam bath and a swimming pool. Now that sounds like a resort to some of us, right? <laughs> But that, that was his fortress. Herod decided, if I'm ever going to have to hide out, I might as well do it in luxury. So that's what he did as he built this, uh, this fortress called, that is called Herodium. And Herod is the one who is ruling over Judea. He's ruling over Jerusalem and Bethlehem. But there's a ruler who is higher than Herod. There's a ruler who is higher up the food chain. In fact, he's the highest ruler and the greatest ruler in the world at that time. He's the emperor of Rome. His name is Caesar Augustus. And that's a name that should sound familiar to us at Christmas time because in Luke chapter 1, it says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. Remember, Caesar Augustus ordered for a census to be taken. He wanted everyone to go back to their hometown to register. And that's why Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem because Bethlehem is the town of David, and they come from the family line of David. So Joseph and Mary had to go to Bethlehem to register to pay taxes. Thank you very much, Caesar Augustus. But Caesar Augustus was also the one who founded something called Pax Romana, Pax Romana, which means Roman peace. He wanted to bring peace all across his empire but what Augustus and Herod don't realize is that the Prince of Peace, the only one who can bring peace, was born right under their noses. The Magi said, where's the one who has been born King of the Jews? We're looking for the King of the Jews. 
And Herod said, basically, that's me. I'm the king of the Jews. And I could imagine the Magi thinking, you're too old. You're, you're like 60. We're looking for a newborn king. So when King Herod heard this news about the Magi, he was disturbed. He was alarmed. He was troubled. Herod had a philosophy. If you were an enemy, he would take you out. And when he finds out that there's a, a new kid in town who claims to be the king of the Jews, this is going to be a problem. Let's go down to verse 4. Matthew 2, verse 4. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. <laughs> by the time the Magi arrived, the shepherds have already visited Jesus. Simeon and, Simeon and Anna already encountered Jesus in the temple. Jesus is closer to two years old than a newborn baby when the Magi visit. Herod called the chief priests and the teachers of the law because he wanted to know where is this baby, where is this child? This child who claims to be the king of the Jews, where can I find him? Where is he? Where, where was he born? And believe it or not, Herod is actually doing a good thing here. He's actually doing a good thing here. He's willing to listen to advice and we need to be willing to listen to advice. That's a biblical concept, to listen to advice. It actually comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 19, verse 20. Proverbs 19, verse 20 says, Listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. Listen to advice and accept discipline, and in the end you'll be wise. You'll be counted among the wise. Now, we don't realize how easy it is for us to get wisdom. If you want biblical wisdom, where should you look? You should look in the Bible. If you want other types of wisdom, you know, there's there's more resources available for wisdom now than there ever was, right? You know, you can you can be old school like me and read a book, or you could go on YouTube and listen or listen to a podcast. There's all kinds of ways to get advice for life. There's no reason not to seek out good advice. The Bible tells us to do that. Listen to advice and accept discipline. See, some people want to hear advice, but they don't always want to follow it. That's the tough part, isn't it? And good for Herod, he was seeking out advice. He said, where will the Messiah come from? And remember, they can't just hop on Google and you know search, where would Jesus be born? Where's the king of the Jews going to be born? So they're looking through the scrolls and they find this verse. They find this verse that the prophet wrote 700 years before Jesus was born. 700 years before Jesus was born, this verse was written. And it comes from the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2. In Bethlehem in Judea replied, For this is what the prophet has written. That's uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 5. You will notice that phrase pops up a lot in the birth story of Jesus. This is what the prophet has written. This is what the prophet has written. It is written. And what we need to remember is that it was written back then, it's written now, and it will be written down long after we're gone, right? These words will always be written down in God's word. God's word will outlive us, and God's word will outlast us. But here was that verse. This was the verse that they needed. It's Matthew chapter 2, verse 6. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. So Herod's worst nightmare is coming true. His fears are confirmed. This child claims to be a ruler. This child claims to be a king. He claims to be the king of the Jews. But here's what sets Jesus apart from every other ruler. He's not just a ruler, but if you look at the last line of Matthew 2, verse 6, 
It says he's a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. That's why we love Jesus, because he loves us, because he shepherds us, because he cares for us. Jesus said in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That's what Jesus did. He laid down his life for us. A ruler who will shepherd my people. So God made the promise in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, 700 years before Jesus. And when we read about it here, this basically means two words. Promise kept. Promise kept. God promised that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. He was born in Bethlehem. This reminds us that God keeps his promises. God <coughs> kept his promise. So Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Herod is in Jerusalem. Do you know how far it is from Bethlehem to Jerusalem? It's only about five miles. It's only about five miles. What's five miles from our church? If you walked five miles south on Highway 17, you would end up at Stetson University. It's not very far. I'm not encouraging you to walk there today, but it's not far. It's close. So that's good news, right? The Magi were looking for Jesus. They, they're in Jerusalem. All they have to do is get to Bethlehem. It's five miles away. That's good news. See, at Christmas time, we put Jesus in the front yard, right? Herod had Jesus in his own backyard, right? So the Magi are so close. They only have five miles to go, and they will go. But the bad news is the chief priests don't go. They don't go find Jesus. The teachers don't go to find Jesus. Herod doesn't go looking for Jesus. And you know what's even worse? Maybe you've never thought about this before. When Herod found out that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, now he has the exact coordinates to find this threat. Because what's happening in this story, we have two opposing kings. We have Herod the Great, a king who will be remembered for murder. And we have Jesus, the king, who is revered for his mercy. One of my advisors on this sermon was, uh, is David Jeremiah. I don't know David Jeremiah. He certainly doesn't know me. But I read his book. He has a book on Christmas. And if you read from somebody's book, they're your advisor. But here's what he said about the difference between Jesus and Herod. David Jeremiah said, Meanwhile, a short walk away, another king of the Jews occupied the crude throne of an animal trough. His legacy was not death, but life, not misery, but joy, not clutching what he had, but giving it away. Instead of having the blood of others on his hands, this king's blood would be freely given to buy his people's pardon. While the throne of Herod would soon be dust, Jesus would rule forever. Most people don't remember Herod the Great, but the world has the opportunity to know about Jesus. And I wonder for King Herod, how can you be so close to Jesus and miss it? How can you be that close to Jesus and, and miss out on the story? In verses seven and eight, watch what happens. Matthew two, seven and eight. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child and as soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. To me, when I read these verses, this is all about Herod trying to stay in control. He called them secretly. He didn't want anybody to know about this. And then he says, go search carefully for the child. And it's like, Herod, what have they been doing for this whole journey? You know, they followed the star, they followed the scriptures, they walked by faith. Who knows how far they traveled? They're already searching for Jesus. That's why they came here. They're looking for the king of the Jews. Herod wasn't looking for the king of the Jews. The chief priests weren't. The teachers of the law were not. But the Magi came looking for the king of the Jews. So Herod is trying to control the situation here. The Magi saw the star, they, the, and God guided them, and they followed the star. 
But Herod says, when you find him, come back and report to me. Again, he's trying to assert his authority. And he says, when you find him, come back to me so that I too may go and worship him. Herod didn't want the Magi to worship Jesus. You know who Herod wants the Magi to worship? Him. Exactly right. And who does Herod the Great want to worship? Himself. Here's a quote from Tim Keller. It's worth hanging on to, I would think. Tim Keller said, In every heart, there is a little King Herod that wants to rule. In every heart, there's a little King Herod that wants to rule. Some of you are nodding your head and smiling because we know we all deal with that little King Herod in our lives. You know, if Herod says, I want to go and worship him, he should have gone with them. Why wait? But Herod really had zero desire to worship Jesus. He wanted to be worshipped. He didn't want to worship Jesus, unfortunately. Let me ask you a question. I don't know if you've ever thought about this before. Think about the characters that we read in the birth story of Jesus. Think of Mary and Joseph. Does God love Mary and Joseph? What's your answer? Yes. All right. Does God love Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of John the Baptist? Yes. Okay. Does God love the shepherds? Yes. Does God love the magi? Yes. Does God love Herod? Yes. 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 Hard for us to accept that, but it's true. There was Jesus in Herod's backyard. He didn't go. He didn't believe. He didn't obey. I enjoy Christmas stories, Christmas movies, Christmas specials, because to me, just about everyone I've seen is a redemption story. There's someone in a difficult situation who is redeemed and brought out of that difficult situation, whether it's Ebenezer Scrooge or the Grinch or George Bailey. But there's no redemption for Herod. There's no redemption for Herod. Here's what could have happened. The Magi could have led the way they could have appeared before Jesus. They bring their gifts. They bow down and worship him. Imagine, if you would, if Herod had followed them out of obedience. If Herod had followed them out of worship. Herod would have stopped his entourage, climbed down out of his chariot. He could have bowed down before Jesus. Herod the Great could have bowed down before Jesus as well. And he could have used his power and his influence to share Jesus across the empire. But we know he didn't do that. That's not how the story ends for Herod. Herod missed his opportunity at redemption from Jesus. How can Herod get that close to Jesus and miss him? But we have to ask ourselves the same question. How close can we get to Jesus and still miss him? See, Herod would shed your blood to save his life, but Jesus shed his blood to save your life, to save our lives. So don't get so close to Jesus that you miss the redemption that only he can provide. Give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's why Jesus came. He came to save us from our sins. And we have a time at the end of every service where we encourage anybody who needs a savior that today's the day to find Jesus. Today's the day to follow Jesus. Today's the day to bow down and confess the name of Jesus, to be baptized in faith in the name of Jesus. So we're going to, we're going to sing an invitation song called Wise Men because the wise men journeyed far and they journeyed by faith to follow Jesus to find Jesus, and we want to be like them. So let's continue after Jesus. Let's not miss Jesus this Christmas. Let's follow him. Let's find him. And remember that he is our redemption. Let's stand and sing that song together. Through the leaf without a doubt, they saw a 